Hello, this is Pink Nomi 13, also known as My Soon Gimade to those of you on Facebook. I have spent the last couple of months analyzing the comment sections of some very specific YouTube videos, and this video is me giving those results to those of you out there on the internet in these circles. Amberlynn Reed, or ALR, she is known in fan and anti-fan forums on the internet, began her YouTube channel in 2013 at about 350 to 360 pounds. She began the channel explicitly to have support from the audience. As she documented her weight loss journey on YouTube, the audience could cheer her on, celebrate her victories, and also encourage her to get back up and try again if she ever messed up. This would be the theme of roughly the first year of ALR videos, and then fans began to notice a recurring pattern within her video uploads. The pattern that was observed would come to be known in fan forums and anti-fan forums as the ALR cycle. The ALR cycle has four distinct phases, and it begins with Amberlynn finding a new diet or exercise program that is definitely going to work. She's researched it, done hours and hours of reading on it, she knows all the ins and outs, and she knows that this program or diet, whatever it is, it's going to work for her for sure. Amberlynn will make a video announcing this new program that she's going to try, and then she dives into great detail into how it's going to work. She tells her viewers how many times a week she's going to upload, what she's going to upload, how the program itself works, and she's generally very excited about how this plan is going to work for her and how she's going to lose weight. And to be honest, the plans that she comes up with aren't bad plans. They could be very successful if implemented correctly. Her mood in these videos is always very positive and uplifted, which draws viewers in and keeps them hooked because, yeah, we're excited. We want to see ALR succeed. So let's keep watching and see how it works out. Which is where the crash of the second stage really bites. And that second stage is where ALR falls off the bandwagon. In the beginning of her YouTube career, this would generally happen a week or two into the program that she was trying. Uh, but in the last six months, as seen with the Jenny Craig saga, ALR can mess up the diet the very next day. And this is no hate. This is no shade, no Tino shade, no pink lemonade, as Zachary Michael would say. Because um, I've been there. I've been trying to lose weight my whole life. I have struggled with disordered eating and mental illness. And I get it. It is totally hard. Losing weight is hard and dealing with your mental health, that is also a struggle. And it's really hard to work on the two together when you've got a lot of other things going on in your life. I, I've been there. I get it. The key to success with these things is that when you slip up, when you make a mistake, you don't give up. You get up, you try again the next day. But again, I understand fully that failure can result in a huge mood swing. You go from this high, like, yeah, I'm doing it. Look at this. I'm awesome. To holy crap, I messed up. I'm a failure. I'm a loser. I'm never going to do this. And you're dejected and depressed. And ALR, whenever she makes a mistake on one of her diet plans, this is how she reacts. She just gets hit with this huge depression and it can take many different forms. Sometimes it's manic anxiety type issues. Sometimes it's a depressed suicidal type situation deal thing. But whatever it is, ALR directs all of her energy at her fans then. She cites bullying, hate speech, fat phobia in her comment sections as the precise trigger for why she could not succeed on this diet she fell off. She made this mistake because of all the depression that's in her comment sections. Again, she says repeatedly in all of her videos that she reads all of these comments. And so she sees every single one. And there is just so much hate and bullying and fat phobia in her comments that it drives her to eat to excess and mess up her diet. And, it, you know, sometimes she said that these comments make her want to kill herself. It's just generally not a good situation for her to be in. But no matter what she says, if she's going to end her life, get off YouTube, whatever, ALR ultimately forgives her fans and agrees to come back and continue on with this saga and just keep on going with what's going on.
and that is the gist of the AOR saga. With the pattern firmly established, AOR began documenting her weight loss journey through the her early years on YouTube, and it began in 2013. By 2015, ALR was with a new girlfriend. She'd moved on from Crystal. The new girlfriend was Destiny, who is pictured on the left here. ALR began her life with Destiny at around 400 pounds. Precise weigh-ins are kind of hard to measure since sometimes she does them and sometimes she doesn't. But the first weigh-in video of 2015 puts ALR at around 420 pounds. With Destiny, AOR was blissfully in love, totally happy. Uh, the couple was very cute together, and in all of their quirky, bizarre ways, they were they were just totally happy with life as it was. AOR began producing more content centered around herself and those in her life, like Destiny, as her videos shifted from exercise with me, what I ate today, cook with me type videos, and more this is my life, get to know me type videos which is fun, and it produced a lot of good content that the fans really reacted well to. Uh, ALR recorded herself performing her spoken poetry and also came out about her mental health issues, including her diagnosis with binge eating disorder. ALR also began doing the mukbang videos around this time that she was with Destiny. Uh, and a mukbang, for those of you who don't know, is a genre of online video content wherein the content creator consumes a meal or a large amount of food on camera. And ALR's mukbang videos produced higher views and therefore more revenue for her. Based on these mukbang videos, ALR was able to make a living off of her YouTube channel and therefore she didn't have to work anymore. So this was now her career. She has to stick with doing this content because this is where her money's coming from. But at the same time, she's doing these mukbang videos. She's also still trying to lose weight and going through this cycle of trying new approaches, new programs, new diets, all of this stuff. This obsession with the mukbang content is kind of where ALR started having some uh, conflict with her viewers. Um, you see, several YouTubers other than ALR have made their career producing mukbang content. Uh, these YouTubers are able to maintain a strict diet outside of their filming, and they also have a very strict exercise regimen, which helps them maintain their overall health. There are also a plethora of other YouTubers that have made a living with mukbang content, but they are also like ALR and have gained an excessive amount of weight in doing so. For longtime viewers who began their uh, fan celebrity type relationship with ALR, um, it's very much clear to them that the mukbang content is ALR's downfall. As it is her financial bread and butter, she cannot easily give it up, but at the same time, it is evidently contributing to her inability to eat balanced meals during the day and contributing to the detriment of her weight loss journey and overall health. And I can back this up with these claims on mukbangs via a 2020 study from Sweden. This study found that mukbangs contribute to eating disorders in two ways. Um, those who are officially diagnosed with disorders like anorexia and bulimia, but also watch mukbang content, are more likely to recover from those disorders in that they will eat more regularly and they will eat more uh, amounts of food than they would otherwise. This is attributed to the solace that they find in eating with somebody on the screen, even though they're not physically present, there's somebody there that they can watch and it's almost like they're eating with a friend and this helps them recover from uh, their anorexia and bulimia in that way that they're eating more food however individuals with binge eating disorder also will eat more food and watching mukbang content for these individuals like alar who have binge eating disorder uh, watching mukbang content is most likely to trigger a restrictive eating slash binge eating episode in the individual in this way mukbang content can easily contribute to the deterioration of those with binge eating disorder and this has repeatedly been brought to ALR's attention through past dietitians and nutritionists and counselors, all of them. Uh, but most famously, uh, the YouTube nutritionist Abby Sharp also mentioned this. As of right now, ALR is still producing mukbang content.
Content controversies aside, ALR continued to upload the content that she wanted to see on her channel and pursuing her weight loss journey. However, it would not be all sunshine and roses for her in this journey. Uh, ALR and Destiny broke up around Christmas of 2016, and in 2017, ALR put herself back out there on the market and was attempting to find true love and happiness. Luckily for her, in 2017, ALR met her current fiancé, Becky. The two have been together for four years and recently announced their engagement. Just saying, in this house, we stand Becky. Go, Becky, go! Despite um, the fan, the strong fandom for Becky, uh, the majority of ALR controversies have come out during her time with Becky. Um, the big ones would be the GoFundMe scandal, uh, the Norma tapes, which this is all very much alleged and things are kind of up in the air like we don't know. But one thing fans have been able to observe in these videos is ALR's treatment of Becky and ALR's overall health. And these things do not speak to ALR being a well woman. Um, in the above right image here, you can see this is taken from her most recent YouTube video, which was uploaded about a week and a half ago, I think. Um, either way, you can see on her face, I'm not talking about the rosy cheeks, but there is some severe discoloration here that does need to be addressed. Um, the skin around her mouth, and this actually does go down her chin and her neck. It's kind of that sickly yellowy green color that apparently this is what jaundice looks like. This is definitely jaundiced skin. This has been confirmed by nurses and medical professionals who do watch ALR videos. Um, that's disconcerting for all the things that jaundice could be represented by. Um, also on her left shoulder, there's a mark that she doesn't say it's a scar. She will just say, I bumped my shoulder into a cabinet. But that mark has been there for a long time now. And that is disconcerting because marks and injuries that take a long time to heal are typically a sign of diabetes. That's how, you know, you hear about people with diabetes that lose their foot. It's because, the, you know, they might nick their toenail when they're clipping it. It bleeds a little, but it never heals and then it develops gangrene. That's kind of what we're seeing here with ALR. And again, that's what people allege. They speculate. This is what we're seeing. ALR denies that she has diabetes. And, and she very well may not. I don't know. But this is what people are seeing. The other thing people are seeing is that she's not losing weight. This is blatantly evident. If you can see here, uh, this is on the left side. This is ALR and Becky on their way to go see Christmas lights last December. ALR is not turned to face Becky in her seat. That is how she has to sit in the front seat. She is sitting pretty much on her left hip bone, and she's kind of got her legs sort of folded into the space under the glove compartment so that she can sit in this manner in the front seat. Um, yeah, that at this point... I don't know that you can call it fitting in the front seat if this is how you have to sit. First of all, my main concern here is that the seatbelt doesn't go around Amberlynn Reed. And we can talk all day about how seatbelts need to have, you know, extenders and be longer and go around individuals. But that seat is pushed all the way back, all the way down. And she has to sit on basically her hip bone to sit in the front seat. I've seen this in real life. This is what happens when you get to be over like 500 pounds and you just can't fit in a car anymore. And it's really disturbing. I've seen this not just in real life, but on my 600 pound life, this is how some individuals sit when you know they're 600 pounds and they don't quite fit in their car anymore. This is just what they got to do to get around. Um, and again, we don't have a confirmed weight for ALR at this point. so. Maybe she is 600 pounds, maybe she isn't, not my place to say, but it's something that's been brought up multiple times that this girl is gaining weight and not losing any, and it's, it's not looking good. 
no matter how you try to paint it, it's just not looking good for Amberlynn Reed. And the anti fans are concerned about it. Um, this also, this scene also pointed something out, and I, I'm kind of, this was a big takeaway for me to like watch how she was behaving in this scene, but all I'm going to say is if you look up her uh, Vlogmas 2020, I believe this is like day 9, 10, 11, 12, it's one of those four, uh, it's the Christmas Lights episode, you should be able to find it, go watch it, make of this scene what you will. That's all I'm going to say. And so right there with that, you have the struggle between Amberlynn Reed and her fans and anti-fans. And I use both of those terms because most of her anti-fans are in fact longtime viewers that have been, they've been watching this forever. They've been rooting for her and rooting for her and they've just become disillusioned with all the times she's tried and failed. Beyond that, what sucks new people in, especially within the last two to three years, is this ALR cycle. Um, you can't get away from this, though, is that this ALR cycle where she starts something new and then, you know, the polar opposite phase of starting something new is blaming the fans for the failure of this new thing. This cycle is essentially a celebrity gaslighting their fans over and over again. And when you've been put through it enough, of course, you're just going to, you're not going to believe her when she says that she's actually going to lose weight. And the thing is, if this cycle really were not a thing, if it was Amber Lynn Reed just picked a diet plan at random out of the comments and tried it, and then she turns around and blames her fans for it not working out, that would be one thing. However, ALR claims that she's done tons and tons of research on these videos and says she's looked into all of these plans that she starts and it's going to work. She swears it's going to work. So there's really no one to blame but herself when they fail. And I get it. When you mess up on a diet, it's a huge blow to your ego and it can be really hard to deal with that. Regardless Every time Ailer slips up on her new diet plan, she blames the people in the comment section. She blames her fans. She blames the haters. It's always in the comment section that is to blame for her failure on these diet plans. These commenters, well, you know, I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. And that's what I set out to find out. So as long as I've been an Amberlynn Reed anti-fan, I've heard these claims about the comment sections and I've heard people saying, yes, there is, yes, there isn't to whatever claim she's made. And when my digital media literacy class came out with this project where we had to analyze some aspect of the internet from a rhetorical standpoint, I knew this is what I want to do. I want to know for once and for all, is there truly fat phobia in ALR's comment section? Is there really hate speech in Ailer's comment section? Is there, you know, death threats and claims that she should kill herself in her comment section? I'm going to find this out and I'm going to tell you how I did it. So the first thing I had to do was figure out the parameters I was going to use to classify the comments in Ailer's comment section. And hate speech is pretty easy to define. Anything that was a death threat, a just overall hateful comment, um, just utterly demoralizing to a Amberlynn Reed, that would be a hate comment. That would be hate speech. Got that? It's done. Um, there would also be comments for other categories, but the one that was really hard to grapple with was the claim that there are fat phobic comments in Amberlynn's comment section. Fat phobia is a relatively new term for kind of nebulous concept really and I needed to define it if I was going to be able to identify it in the comment section. So I did some research. I looked at a bunch of articles online um, but they weren't really scholarly in nature, nothing really definitive and the definition really changed between the articles. So I looked in my school's online journal database and I found some articles that were kind of helpful. 
From my research in these articles, I was able to determine that bat phobia is largely experiential in nature. It is something you experience. You don't really define it. You just, you live it and you know, oh my gosh, that's what it was. It's kind of like pornography in that respect. You can't really say what for sure it is, but you know it when you see it. Um, so generally it's not a set list of actions or words. It's instead more or less a perceived attitude within those words that the fat individual in question then experiences. And that I'm going to define as the microaggressive fat phobia in the comment section. It's just something that's experienced by the individual and it's not necessarily meant, but it's there. Um, in a more broad sense, fat phobia can loosely be defined as discrimination against fat individuals. This would be what we would consider the slurs against fat, morbidly obese individuals, such as land whale, calling them a pig or a cow. So you've got that. Um, some individuals also consider it to be a lack of accommodation for fat individuals in places like restaurants and movie theaters, so on and so forth. But, you know, clothing shops that don't carry the extra large, extra, extra, extra large sizes. Um, the fact that I added so many extras right there, that could be considered fat phobic, so on and so forth. On the bottom of this slide, you will find the three articles that I cited in my research paper, since I found those to be most helpful in kind of coming up with this definition of the microaggressive fat phobia and the just straight up fat phobia. With the definition of fat phobia in mind, I came up with roughly six categories that I figured I would find in the comments. And upon going through one of our videos, I was able to confirm that these categories would work for the purposes of the study. So first of all, of course, we have the hate comments. Those would be the death threats, etc. And the fat phobic fat shaming comments, which I defined on the previous slide. And then I would have the supportive comments. And those are underneath the purple bar. Supportive comments would be anything that just outright says, hey, we're rooting for you. I love you. You're awesome. Things like that. P things people want to hear. The red column has the constructive criticism in it. And this would be anything that is meant to help ALR lose weight. Things like um, maybe instead of drinking three sodas at a restaurant, try water or, you know, having instead of the two Big Macs and two 10 piece chicken nuggets and two large fries and two Sundays, maybe just have one of each. Things like that, things that can actually help her lose weight. That's all been documented. I didn't feel I needed a ton of research on what could be constructive criticism since it's kind of what we we all know so i have come the constructive criticism section there that column and then orange is the hater nation these are strictly anti-fan comments they differ from the hate comments in that they they, they could kind of look supportive but there's very much a negative tone, negative connotation in the comments. It also might indicate that a viewer has been watching Amberlynn read for a long time or talking about things that anti fans notice and pick out in her videos. Last but not least is the gray column, and that's just random comments that really have nothing to do with the video. Most of these I found were just kind of people talking back and forth to each other about something that had nothing to do with Amberlynn Reed. And ultimately I threw those comments out of the equation and just found more. Now for this, as you can see here on the screen, I copied and pasted comments into an Excel spreadsheet. And I did this 500 Amberlynn Reed content related comments from three videos. I did 500 from each of those videos for a total of 1,500 comments altogether. It took me a long time. I'm really proud of the fact that I did this. I conducted this research and I came up with the following numbers that you're going to see on the next screen. So now with those 1,500 comments totaled and coded into the different categories they belonged into, this was the overall result. Roughly 62% of the comments were supportive in nature. 27% belonged distinctively to the hater nation comments. 
And then only 6%, and I think it was actually something like 5.87% of the comment section were fat phobic. Hate speech similarly comprised approximately 5% of the 1,500 comments examined. I found nothing in three videos that I looked at that said anything about ALR needing to die, that she should just commit suicide. I found nothing like that. I found some things that were very hateful. I did not find anything that said she should die. I None of that was in there. Um, also, as you can see here, the random, there, there's no slice of this pie. I didn't get to pick the colors for this. Sorry, it just came with the program. Um, there's no slice of the pie for random or constructive criticism. That's because overall, as you can see on the previous slide, the constructive criticism really overlapped strongly with either hater nation or supportive comments. And for the most part, they were very much supportive. Like, we believe in you. You just got to, you know, get up and try again the next day. Those kinds of comments. So ultimately, I divided up the constructive criticism into hater nation or supportive comments, sort of redefining the constructive criticism as a supportive comment. And that's how we ended up with 62%. Initially, I thought I was going to see a huge difference between different types of videos. There were three different videos I examined. One was an eat with me, cook with me video. The other one was, um, I forget what it was called, but it was definitely a mukbang. It was the Cheeto one. And then um, the other one was when she went and ate in the restaurant and she saw a morbidly obese girl and she was um, talking about her thoughts on that, which that video was actually kind of interesting. Um, I thought I was going to see some distinct differences in the level of comments, and I kind of did. Um, I would have to go back and like add them up all over again in order to put them in the video. But overall, it still remained that over two thirds of the comment section, or roughly two thirds of the comment section anyway, were just supportive for ALR. I think one video I saw something like 73%. Another video was like 59%. Either way, it averaged out to, you know, 62% of the comments, 62% of the 1,500 comments that I coded were supportive. So if Amberlynn Reed really is going through and reading all of these comments, it really is just a small percentage that is, you know, is triggering these results in her, at least from the data that I got, which leads me to just defining my results overall. So is Amberlynn Reed's comment section truly full of all of this bullying and hate? I honestly can't say. I cannot say one way or another from an empirical standpoint, that is this purely data-driven, research-based, scientific approach to looking at the comment sections and categorizing them and everything, I really just don't have enough data to make a conclusive statement one way or another. On every single video I viewed, I got 500 comments from those videos, but here's the thing, I only got three videos. I just simply do not have enough time to go through every single one of her videos and get 500 comments from all of her videos because she's got hundreds on her channel at this point. And I also don't have time to go through the thousands of comments that are on a lot of her older videos. I went through um, three of her most popular videos of all time, according to YouTube metrics. Some of them have almost 5,000 videos on there and 500 videos out of that 5,000, that's 10%. While that might be a substantial sample for data collection, it's definitely not the most accurate one. Um, I would need a lot more time to go through a lot more comments and code all of them to draw a definitive conclusion about what there is in the comments. And frankly, even if I you know, do sample the top thousand comments, the top 2,000 comments out of a video with 4,000, if Amberlynn Reed really is reading all of the comments on every single one of her videos, there could be death threats that I'm just missing. There could be stuff in there that I just don't see. Based on what I was able to find, is there a lot of this on there? No. 
is it an accurate sample size to tell me what I'm going to find in the other thousands of comments that are out there? Also, no. Uh, the other thing is these videos were also significantly old. Her most popular videos of all time, the most recent of them of the top 10, I think was three years old. And the videos I was looking at, they were all from her top, I think, top five, maybe the top six. They were all at least four years old. So she's had more time to get comments on these videos. Some of them were from Hater Nation saying things like, oh, ha ha, I'm coming from, you know, 2020. You're, you know, morbidly obese. You're almost 600 pounds. You don't fit in your car. Things like that. These are people that have been sucked in and they're going back and watching these videos over and over again from like now, even though the video might be from 2016. So it may not be honestly reflective of what's going on in her comment section today. Was it going on, you know, was all this hate speech and bullying going on back then? It doesn't look like it. Maybe it's there. Maybe it's not. I, I honestly can't say one way or another. They're just, I, the data says no, but the data itself might not be substantial enough to say one way or another. Now, that's just for hate speech and overall over bullying, the death threats, that kind of thing. Is there fat phobia in Amberlynn's comment sections? Well, that's a totally different question. Earlier on my slide, when I defined what fat phobia actually is, and again, I was not able to concretely define that. I did mention that there were approximately two different kinds, you know, two categories we could roughly determine that exist within the realm of fat phobia. Uh, you know, one was the microaggressive form where it's very experiential and it's something perceived on behalf of the individual. And the other is overt, direct slurs towards an individual. Um, is there any of that in Amberlynn Reed's comment section? Uh, both, yes. But here's the huge caveat. Uh, when it comes to fat phobia directed at Amberlynn Reed, um, unless I'm her, I can't say for sure if the microaggressive form is there directed at her. But I can say that there's five, six percent of her comment section is overt fat phobia directed at her. And again, there could be more buried down deeper that I just didn't get to. But overall, it's a very small amount that is berating her for her weight, her size, any of that. Interestingly enough, the microaggressive form does show up in Amberlynn Reed's comment sections, and it takes up approximately 33%. If I were to just guess based on the numbers that I was seeing, um, about a third of her comment section expresses fat phobia, but it's not directed at her. It is experienced by the commenters who are sympathizing with Amberlynn Reed. In a lot of these videos, they're saying the same thing as her, where they're like, yeah, I know how you feel. I understand why you think this way, or I understand what you're doing because I've done the same thing. I struggle with this as well. Um, there were a lot of stories in the comment sections of people saying things like, um, I understand what you mean when people judge you when you eat different things because I feel that way too whenever I eat a cookie. It doesn't matter if I'm eating one cookie or an apple. I feel like I'm judged, you know, and that's something that's been reflected in Amberlynn's videos over time. So is there fat phobia in her comment section? Absolutely. Is it all directed at her and is it all bullying? Absolutely not. That I can say for sure. Now, what Amberlynn Reed feels is fat phobic, that is entirely up to her. And this is a debate for another video, not something I was able to conclusively say one way or another. But if you are some kind of internet site, social media forum that is trying to, uh, you know, moderate their content and eliminate fat phobia, you have to have some concrete definitive examples of what is and is not fat phobic speech if you're going to moderate that content on your site. Just saying, well, this is fat phobic because it feels fat phobic to me, that's not enough. It, you really have to have something more concrete to say it is or it isn't. 
Otherwise, my suggestion for an individual that is feeling this way, you know, not because somebody's saying, oh, you're too fat to do this, but, you know, they feel that judgment, I would highly suggest that you seek out therapy. It's something I've done and I've been doing for years. It's over, it's helped me overcome a lot of these feelings and, you know, understanding why I feel judged and how, how to work through those kinds of just being bullied feelings, even when it's not overtly bullying you. Um, so that would be my suggestion to any individual dealing with that fat phobia. And that would be my findings on that. So um, another uh, critique Amberlynn Reed has about her anti-fans is that her haters are all obsessed with her and they just want to tear her down. and. Um, I, uh, you know, at the beginning of this, I had uh, two pictures of my face up because, you know, I'm not afraid to show my face. I'm not ashamed. I'm not ugly. And I'm also not obsessed with Amberlynn Reed. I just, uh, weight loss and taking health in that regard seriously is something that's very near and dear to my heart. I'm going to explain why. Um, this is my maternal grandmother. My granny, uh, she passed away uh, about two years ago, and she died of complications due to being obese. And um, what happened? Well, first of all, this picture here on the screen. Um, this is probably my favorite picture of her. Um, see, what happened was she had a series of infections, sepsis infections, that uh, put her in and out of the hospital for um, pretty much the a year before this ultimately hit in 2018 and um well she, she wasn't allowed to eat they had to have like tubes in her throat and all and this was she was just hungry she was so hungry and they finally gave her a popsicle to chew on because it would melt and you know she could swallow water so yeah you know, she got the popsicle and she's like don't eat a buddy take my popsicle from me you will not take this food for me and it's just so it encapsulates the spunk and the iron will that my granny had that just one of the things that I love about her. And, um, but she died of complications due to being obese. Um, what had happened was she had a gallbladder infection, presumably in 2017. And because she was so obese, the machines, she could fit into the machines, like the CT scans and the MRIs and all that. She could fit into those machines, but the machines um, could not penetrate her fat to the point that they could identify that there was a gallbladder infection. And so what happened is her gallbladder continued to deteriorate and the infection raged on. It was getting in her blood, causing numerous sepsis infections. And then the gallbladder completely necrotized within her. And what had happened in May of 2018 is that she, you know, her heart was not able to continue to pull the fluid off of various parts of her body and her lungs were beginning to fill with fluid. So the doctors had to do surgery and procedures on her lungs through her throat, hence the popsicle picture to uh, get the fluid off of her lungs and try to save her life. And it wasn't until September that they discovered that the gallbladder had completely necrotized and it was taking um, parts of her stomach and intestines with it. They had to actually do open surgery to find this because the scanning equipment at the hospital simply could not penetrate the layers of fat on my grandmother. Um, at this time, my grandmother was a approximately 500 pounds when all of this was going on. Um, she was not that way her whole entire life, but obesity does run in my family. It is something that um, it plagues us all. And, uh, you know, I, I watched her die her last a 10 months, 10 months in the hospital, I watched her die. Um, her body just simply couldn't put up with all of the infections and the trauma that it endured. So, um, May, 2018, she went into the hospital, she recovered, they found the gallbladder issue. They were able to 
get it all out mostly and um she had to keep recovering from that she passed away in march 2019 um you know you could say it was sepsis you could say it was pneumonia you could say it was a heart attack whatever you wanted to say it was but it was you know the root of it all was the fact that she was so overweight and um that you know that that ultimately is what killed her and um it, it hurts because I know, like I said, it runs in my family and I'm watching one of my uncles deal with complications of being obese. And if I'm honest, I am terrified I'm going to lose my mom the same way that I lost my grandma. And I, I, I couldn't live with that. But I know I can't control anyone else. I can't control what my mom does, how my mom lives how she eats whatever i can't control any of that all i can do is make changes for myself and i come into this project with the experience of being overweight with being bullied for your weight and being bullied for your looks and you know i know what amberlynn's gone through and i i totally understand i empathize with a lot of it but at the same time i also fully understand you know, I've, I've done, come to think of it, I've tried, I started this channel on YouTube to be a weight loss channel and I couldn't keep up with it. And I, I just stopped because I would rather stop altogether than, you know, keep trying and trying and trying and not succeeding or worse, failing in the opposite direction. And, you know, I tried a weight loss channel and I couldn't keep it up. I don't know that I would ever go back to that. But I know I have to make changes in my life so that I can continue living. Um, maybe through my example, my mom will be able to make some changes and she'll be able to, she'll be able to live a lot longer than her mom did. I just, healthy at every size, healthy at any size, the fat acceptance movement, you know, I get it. There's some great points. But there comes a time and place you can't deny the science. Being obese is not healthy for you. You cannot be a healthy human being at 500, 600 pounds. You, sim you simply can't. And it can kill you. And it's not the, just the heart disease or the diabetes. It's you know, things like my grandmother, a gallbladder infection. That's not hard to treat. That's, that's really easy to cure. And that's what ultimately killed her because they didn't find it for years because of how fat she was. So don't, don't be like my family. Don't leave people behind because of something that you ultimately can change. I know it's hard. I've been there. I've done it. I've struggled. I've stumbled. I've fallen. I've fallen in an opposite direction. I, you know, I've gained weight. I've lost weight. I, I've been there. I know it's freaking hard. But is it any harder than your loved ones having to say goodbye to you for your time? You know, again, I can't change my mom. I can't change anybody else in this world. I just, this is what I did for this project. This is what I found. This is my research. And this last eight minutes here, this is my story, and this is why I did it. And it's not to shame Amberlynn Reed. It's not to, you know, provide ammo for the anti-fans. It's to just be a warning. You know, this is what could happen to you if you don't take your health and your weight seriously. Don't leave your loved ones behind like this. Take care of yourself.